G'day, welcome to True Blue History. I'm Adam Bloom. Today's special guest is Dr. Janet Butler from the La Trobe University in Melbourne. And Janet is the author of Kitty's War, the remarkable wartime experience of Kit McNaughton, based upon the previously unpublished war diaries of Great War Army Nurse, Sister Kit McNaughton. And Janet has joined us today to share Kit's story and also give us an insight into World War I nursing. Hi, Janet. Thanks for joining us on the show. Hi, Adam. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. So just for the listeners, Janet, can you just give us a little bit of background about you and how you came to be interested in World War I history? Well, I was passing the War Memorial. My father and I were out riding our bikes in the little country town where I grew up, and we passed the World War I monument, which is a set of memorial gates. And we stopped and we looked at the list of soldiers. And I had gone past those gates thousands of times as a child, looked at them. My father had known their, their sons, the next generation down, I'd gone to school with the grandchildren and I had never noticed that there were two World War Army nurses out of order under the names of the soldiers. And I said to my father, do you know those families? And he said, no, I don't. And the days passed and the idea that they had grown up in the town where I had grown up had stood on the same soil as I had in that place of, you know, bluestone walls and creeks and wheat fields. And they had gone away to the First World War, away from this tiny town. I just wanted to know what had happened to them because we kind of think about the First World War in terms of what it means for us, you know, what it means for the fact that that we went, that we're involved, you know, what it meant for us, what it means for us now. But I wanted to know what it meant for them. I wanted to know what happened to them. I wanted to know, did they come back? I didn't even know that. So a few days later, when the idea just wouldn't let me go, I rang Ken Simons at our local RSL. And he said to me, it's funny you should ring about those nurses. He said, because we've researched every soldier on that monument, but we know nothing about the nurses. And if you find out about them, we'll dedicate our annual Remembrance Day service to them. And he said, and there's one McNaughton that I know of that's left in Little River. And where I lived in Lara, there's the Yuyang Ranges and Lara is at the front and Little River is at the side. And we share the one monument, which is why I was in Lara going past it and Kit's name was on it. So I rang them and um, I got in contact with them. They were Kit's nephew great nephew um, and he said yes that's my auntie Kit and I went around there with a with a barrel of Anzac biscuits that I'd made and he introduced me to Kit's nephew with whom she had um, lived when she came back from the war and he took me across the the fields of Lara and Little River to show me the ruins of her house and of her future husband's house and he introduced me to the granddaughter who said to me and I can still remember you know, she wrote a diary and I said, oh, can I see it? And so they let me look at the family were fantastic. And I ended up going back to La Trobe to university and doing my PhD on Kit's journey through war based on her diaries. It's, it's a remarkable story that just by chance, you just happened to go past this, these gates and there it was that it was like a, a calling for you to, to research Kit's story and I I guess in the broader sense too Janet is the Anzac nurses as well because their story is really it's not really known is it to to the Australian we know the Anzac story but we don't really we don't really look into the Anzac nurses do we no we don't Um, I always say Kit found me and that's why she was a very strong personality and she thought you'll do Um, but you are right. And I think it was because after the First World War, the stories that we told ourselves about our experience of the war really focused on the frontline combatant, um, in particular the wounded one, who really had permission to talk about 
their experiences and the nurses were invisible in those stories you know Um, the nurses themselves too were complicit in that because they were a generation of women who were brought up to serve other people they were self-effacing they were modest they would never have put themselves forward and so they um, after the first world war weren't weren't saying well we were there too Um, And it really took a a revolution in the way we wrote history. It turned to social history, the women's movement, to ask where were women in the Anzac story? And they brought the the nurses back inside of the framework of Anzac where I'm certain the soldiers that they served would have wanted them to be. Certainly the nurses saw themselves as part of that story. I was going to ask you, with with the nurses, they... They didn't face any less dangers, did they? They were in, they were sometimes only seven kilometres from the front lines in casualty clearing stations, and they they faced the the same dangers that the men faced at the front, didn't they? Look, they did face danger. Um, nurses died. We lost about at least twenty five, and it's a sign of how things have gone that we don't actually know how many nurses died as a result of their work war service. Uh, we're still we're still looking for them and recording them. They they went down with ships, and as you say, they were very close to the front in casualty clearing stations, where you know the shells were landing on the clearing stations. Um, they were in clearing stations or attacked. Some Australian nurses were awarded the military medal for their behaviour during these attacks. But I, I do think they weren't. After all is said in the trenches. They were on the second battlefield. They, and it was um, an enormous strain and they faced things that they never would have believed that they would have faced, but they weren't in the trenches. And I think there's there's a difference there that we, you know, we do need to be aware of. They, they knew what the men were going through and they had their own huge um, challenges as well on the second battlefield. But I guess they were, it was a difference of degree um, and of kind. They weren't in the French trenches. They weren't going over the top. Do we know, Janet, exactly how many nurses enlisted for World War One? Do we have those records on hand? We don't. We don't. We have some. Um, and uh, nurse historians such as Kirsty Harris are compiling databases. It's currently somewhere in the region of, say, between 2,700 and 3,000 went overseas with the Australian Army Nursing Service. But there were an additional, probably at least three or 400 nurses who enlist, enlisted with the Queen Alexandra's Imperial Nursing Service. They didn't want to wait, so they went overseas and enlisted in Britain. And there were other nurses, you know, who did a variety of other things. Um, so, no, we don't have numbers. It's probably, I'd be guessing, but it'd be in the region of about 4,000. And, well, one thing that I've read as I wanted to get you on to talk about a kit story, but also the World War I nurses in the broader sense, is that when a nurse, because they they faced some pretty strict restrictions, didn't they? If they got married or they they would then have to resign from the army, was it? Their nursing service, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, they did. Um, they had They had to be single. Um, or they could be widowed. If they married, they, they were sent home. Um, some hid their marriages because they didn't want to, you know, move away from their service. But I guess this is an ongoing thing. I mean, nurses had to resign when they were married in my living memory. Um, so did um, staff on aeroplanes. So it was part of the the role of women the way that women were restricted that that kept going well into the 60s and 70s so how many diaries did kit write during her service and are they still in the care of her family or have they been donated to the australian war memorial no that she wrote three diaries three little books um and they're still in the care of the family so can you tell us a little bit about Kit's experiences at Gallipoli or leaving, so embarking for, for service? What what Does it say in her diary why she wanted to go and, and help the men at the, at the front? And can you tell us about her 
journey from leaving Melbourne and then going to Gallipoli? Well, Kit embarked on the Orsava um, in early July 1915. There was a massive um, recruitment drive in July 1915. A lot of men enlisted then and she was leaving at the tail end of that. But the diary, like most of the nurses' diary, began the minute she stepped on board, not a second before. And it's all part of the idea of what a good woman is, what a good nurse is, that you don't put yourself um, forward. Um, There has to be a reason for you writing about yourself. And travel diaries and travel journals were very much um, something she would have known about. They were published, you know, uh, journals of people going overseas. So it was a it was something that people were gifted when they were going overseas. And she was given her travel diary by a friend. But it's interesting that inside the cover, she writes very neatly in one side. Um, Kitty McNaughton of um, Little River, but on the other side of the opening pages, much more strongly, she's got Sister Kit McNaughton, um, her cabin number and the author, and she underlines it because this was a story that she was going to tell. So the story that's in the diary is really to tell the people at home educational things, Um, interesting things and it was expected that some of the things that she'd be telling would be thrilling but it was meant to share so the idea of private diary is very much something from the 1950s back in Kit's time it was an aid memoir like like photographs or Facebook would be today it was to share what what they were going through she seems like a very from and uh, from reading your book and and what I've seen on Kit is she seems a very strong and proud woman. Is that is that a fair assessment of of her character? She was very strong. She was stern. She was um, adventurous. She was forthright. But I think they were judging from the research I did. They're fairly common characteristics of the nurses. They were like that as a breed. They were very strong women. Um, She grew up in Little River on a farm. Her family was not as prosperous as as other members of of the wider family. And so all of her, she and her siblings went out to work and she she became a nurse, um, had her first shift at 6.30 in the morning, um, a three months probation. And you had to be pretty tough to go through that that the training was physical people were rejected if they didn't think they could they could stand the physical nature of the training they were long hours um though it's low pay um conditions weren't great their wages have stood still for 20 years so we think that they had they had a tough time at war but we forget that they were working under fairly tough conditions at home and when she got on that ship with 200 other nurses, they were the ones that were trained to discipline, not the 2,000 soldiers around them. The nurses knew how to, you know, take orders and because they'd been trained for it. So how was her time on Lemnos and was it a, was it a shock to her when she, because obviously like she'd done her nursing training here in Australia, but then... Mm -hmm. Obviously, wartime like wartime injuries are very different to normal nursing. Yeah. And what was what do we get from her diary entries of, of Lemnos? Well, Kitty went to Lemnos from Egypt, so she went by ship to um, Suez. She was taken up to Cairo, where she was part of the staff of the Second Australian General Hospital, where she nursed in Cairo. The huge rush of casualties from the August offensive on Gallipoli, where she was seeing illness and gunshot wounds and the Gallipoli veterans themselves who were, you know, um, very highly regarded in Australia. So she was meeting them. All this was going into her diary. But then she volunteered to go to Lemnos because the nurses, they were very restricted at home. They lived in nurses' homes. They were the more restricted sex. Um, travel and war were really men's domains at the time. So they, they had to negotiate their way, argue their way into war. But where they wanted to be, 
was as close as possible to their men. Um, that's not where the army um, hierarchy wanted them to be. And you could tell that from the baggage that they were allowed to bring. They were meant to stay in the bases, which were in Cairo hundreds of miles from the front. But the nurses wanted to be where they could best serve their boys, where they could also experience real life to the full. And, you know, even adventure, even danger. So she volunteered, she went to Lemnos, but I think the situation that they went into, they were not prepared for. They were then attached to a stationary hospital, an Australian stationary hospital, which despite its name was meant to be very mobile to be able to move at a minute's notice and, and get close to the front. But the thing about it is under those conditions, it had no men on its staff. It was never raised to have men on its staff. Neither were clearing stations or forward dressing stations. Nurses were meant to be way, way back in the base. These were along the lines of communication. And so they walked into a situation that they weren't expecting. The, they were needed very badly, which is why they were asked for, but they weren't wanted. And the, they weren't wanted because they were out of place. They were going into a, an, a medical camp close to the front and all of the arguments about why a nurse shouldn't be at war then came into play. They were worried, the authorities, that, that liaisons between nurses and soldiers would lead to poor discipline, um, that a nurse at the front would be completely out of place because men were the ones that were meant to be, you know, that close to the front line. And so in the diary, we really don't see the way that they were treated. They were also in authority over the non-commissioned officers and that caused problems because women in authority were also problematic. Um, so give them giving orders as they needed to in order to get, because they walked into a situation with being no nurses and they were shocked. Men were lying on the ground um, in muddy mattresses. Um, they were unwashed. They had lice, their hair was long, and the nurses bustled in. If you imagine 25 nurses, no nonsense, Australian nurses bustling into this situation, they got it sorted. And that, that didn't endear them either to the orderlies because they were ordering them to bring bedpans in, to raise the beds, to wash the men, um, and that caused problems. But it was magnified for the nurses because the actual physical conditions were very difficult. The food on Lemnos was no better than it was on Gallipoli. So they were living on hard rations, emergency rations sometimes, and half rations some of the time. So bully beef, hard biscuits, they were breaking their teeth, um, tea. Um, the, the naval men on the harbour used to send cakes and things from their own gifts from home. They were cut off from that kind of things for themselves because their mail was going to Cairo, had no letters, had no parcels. It was freezing because it was going into winter and um, Lemnos is subject to gales. They were under canvas and the tents were blowing down. Um, they didn't have adequate clothing. In the end, they were given the clothing of the men, great coats and breeches, and they loved it um, because they were warm and it gave them freedom. Um, they were overworked. So the, there were many more um, men, hundreds more men, than um, the schedule would be for nurses at a stationary hospital. And there was disease. So the sites, there was a lot of disease on Lemnos carried by flies, um, caused by poor sanitary conditions. And so they became sick. They, they got sick very quickly with dysentery and things like that. Kate, um, Kitty got paratyphoid. Um, so it was an enormously difficult situation for them and they never said a word about it in their diaries, not a single word. It's I'm I'm listening to I'm listening to this, Janet, and I'm I'm sitting going, this is just unbelievable. Like to hear this for the first time. Like I I I, I had heard that Lemnos had been tough, but it it's it's different hearing it from uh, the nursing side to like. 
they had to really be resilient and and i guess the they were alone they they really had to rely on each other didn't they to to band together and and, and really come through these hard this hardship they did the friendship between the nurses was really really important to them it gave them a place there were expectations of how nurses should behave um, they were supposed to be cheerful all the time and the the only real image of nurses going overseas was the um, ministering angel um, uh, Florence Nightingale who famously stood in the snow for 24 hours before she was allowed into a hospital and you know she was resilient um, and when they found themselves at a loss in the face of that and there was also the idea that also applied to the soldiers that active service meant you know things would be rough and they didn't want to after arguing that they should be at war they didn't want to say well we're too weak for this um so they had each other you know the close friendships between women were a place where they could be themselves and be supportive when outside they were they were not being treated perhaps as they should they had each other for support and they had groups of friends and they also had a special friend within that, what they call their special pals. Um, really to be at war without one was to be, you know, bereft because they were an anchor in, a, in an unusual and difficult world. So Kit's story reveals that throughout the war, she was engaging in basically two wars. One was against a foreign enemy and the other was close to home. It was no secret, as you've just mentioned, that the military authorities didn't want female nurses. When they did agree to accepting them, what kind of service were they expecting the nurses to provide? I think they let the nurses go in the end because what the nurses... Nursing was, was a primarily feminine um, calling, a vocation, and... The nursing associations have said to them, you know, the way to be a preeminent nurse is to be preeminently womanly. So the authorities let them come because they could provide things like domestic care, um, moral support, um, that, that kind of um, emotional support for the men, womanly things. And that's the reason why the female doctors didn't get to go because they weren't the kind of qualities that were expected in a doctor. So the female doctors, our Australian doctors, wonderful women doctors, they never got to go with the Australian army. They went overseas and enlisted with the Scottish Women's Army and did sterling service over there. But one of them was famously told if she wanted to serve to go home and knit. Um, so the nurses were lucky in that way. They were the only, the, some masseuses were, were able to go too but they were the only women permitted to go officially to war with the Australian army the first women so Janet sorry to sorry to cut you off there do we because with the with the Boer war and wars before that what role do we know that nurses played they did go but they went from the states okay they were kind of privately funded because we were colonies then um, so they went from the individual colonies. There wasn't an Australian army. Um, there were just state-based forces. Even the riflemen that went were, you know, the New South Wales Bushmen. So this was after the Boer War. They started agitating for, you know, an organisation which would have nursing reserves trained for war. And when the First World War came, they said, OK, you know, we should be able to go and... They did allow them to come. They staffed the general hospitals, which were going to be at the bases, with nurses from Australia. So do you feel, Janet, that the nurses for them, was it a sense of duty to, to start of, of coming of age of their own, their own independence that nurses enlisted to go and help the men at the front? Or is it something else? I think it was the same as the men. It's a, Everybody went for different reasons, but there's a are usually a combination of reasons. So they went for duty because, you know, it was it's the same way the men enlisted in order to serve. They wanted to serve their boys and to serve the empire. So there was a service aspect to it. 
There was also a freedom aspect to it because the nurses really were very restricted at home. Even private nurses, there was a, in those days, nurses worked in the hospitals, but they also worked in as private nurses, but they lived in nursing homes, big um, nursing homes in Melbourne. There are about seven huge ones whose doctors would ring them, the matrons would send um, a nurse to a private home where they would nurse people who were ill because the hospitals then were all public. They were meant really for the poor. And in these nursing homes, they were heavily restricted in what they could do. And so to go to war, they were going away from all those restrictions. It was a flight from restrictions and into adventure. Like the soldiers, most of them would never have had the chance to go overseas because their pay would not have allowed them to. They would never have been able to afford to experience what she did going overseas like that. Um, and also, I did speak to her great her nephew. He said that he felt that Kit probably went into nursing to escape cooking for the shearers. Partly, you know, there was there weren't that many options for women, and this offered them a chance to be part of something in the way that women really weren't allowed to be. There was this huge thing going on, and as nurses, they could be part of it as well. So we, we know that the, so Gallipoli, the evacuation happens. How long did Kit stay at Lemnos for? And did she end up going back to Cairo? And then she, she obviously went on to the Western Front. How long was she in transition for? Um, a few months. So they came off, they waited for the men to come off Gallipoli. They were expecting it to be a disaster. So they evacuated all the patients that they could, expecting there'd be an influx of very badly wounded men, and there weren't. So in January, they had New Year's Eve in Lemnos, and then they went back to Cairo, and they were kept there because the men were then reorganised. The, the mounted men were separated from the infantry, the infantry was expanded, and the infantry ended up being sent to the Western Front and some of the hospitals went with them. So the first AGH and the second went off to um, the Western Front with the men. And what was Kit's experience like in the diary? Do we see that she sees a totally different war from what Gallipoli was to the Western Front? Do we see that in her diary? Yes, she does. She has a brief interlude in Cairo while all this is going on, and it's mainly social. And you see the nurses... Really, I think about it as the last light before the dark. You know, they they enjoyed each other's company, the friends they'd met on Lemnos. It was very social in ways, you know, possibly they wouldn't have had at home. And then they went to the Western Front. And she was very early on in Marseille. Her hospital was used as a kind of filter because all of the infantry from Australia who'd been in Egypt and Gallipoli were being brought onto the Western Front, but they were carrying disease. And so they had to act as a filter so that these diseases were not carried onto a Western Front where there were millions of men. And they were very successful. Um, they caught three cases of typhus, which would have just been a disaster if it got onto a Western Front because it, it was borne by lice and another lice-borne illness on the Western Front, trench fever, just was rife. They wouldn't have been able to control it. The British didn't believe them. They had the experience and they said, look, this is typhus. And they said, no, it can't be. But they were right because they'd seen it. Then as the a, as a preparations for the Somme went on, there was a matron in chief from England who was in charge of all of the nurses working in France. And she looked at the Australian hospitals and they were staffed completely with fully trained nurses, about 115 of them in each hospital, which was hugely more than the British hospitals had because the British hospitals used VADs, um, voluntary aid detachments who would do the work. Um, a lot of the sisters in there were supervisory. And so the matron in chief said, we need to reinforce the um, hospitals further, closer to the front you don't need all those nurses at the moment. Lend them to us and we'll give them back when you want them. And Kit was one of the nurses taken away from the second AGH 
transported all the way across France and put in a British hospital in Boulogne base um, ready for the song, which she didn't see coming, of course. And so she was in a hospital. It was a stationary hospital, but because the war itself was stationary, everybody was in trenches and nobody was moving anywhere, they were often as big as the general hospitals. And there were a lot of these hospitals based at Boulogne and the stationary hospitals specialised. So her hospital specialised in um, self-inflicted wounds, in fractures, in um, those shell shock, but they also specialised in severely wounded German soldiers. So they didn't have to have guards at all the other hospitals and that's the ward that Kit was put into. And what was her experience like with, with the Germans? Did she, obviously she, she started to care for them and, and I read in your book that I saw it that she said, cutting into another German today. And, and did her attitude towards the Germans change as she started to understand these men and, and uh, the nursing took over? It did. It did. Um, the Germans, there was a lot of anti-German propaganda because of the sinking of the Lusitania. There was a report released just before she went there about how badly um, Allied prisoners of war were being treated. And so, she, and there was an idea that they were a war loving, you know, country. And that, of course, there was the rape of Belgium as well as they, as they called it at the time. So she was quite anti-German and she did say, you know, I cut into a German today and extracted a bullet and, and I was glad to do it. Um, and she used to say, look, they seem to like war. But of course, she was, as Australians were discovering how Australian they were, because Australian, of course, had only been a country federated for about 13 years before the war began. Most people had very strong state loyalties. Overseas, after Gallipoli, they, they had begun to see each other as Australians. So they were discovering themselves as Australian, what are we like and, and that sort of thing. But when she was with the Germans, she was discovering the limits of that kind of national feeling because she, as she nursed them, she discovered, you know, what she would, that they were just other human beings like she was. And she started to say things like that, like um, a, a balloon, an observation balloon was shot down and the people in it were burnt, they were Germans. And she said, you know, poor, poor things are only doing their bit. She saw German prisoners of, of war taking cups of tea to the guards and said, isn't it weird, you know, we're at each other's throats and then we're having a chat and a smoke. And it, it wasn't just the nurses, it was everybody coming into contact with the Germans. You know, the, the songs at um, Christmas Eve and all those kind of stories they trade buttons as souvenirs. And in the end, um, the government put a stop to it. They said there's no more fraternising with the Germans because they could see where it was going, that, that they were realising that they're just other people like us. And this was on top of the war weariness that the song was bringing. So after the war, after the song, you get people who are just burnt out by what has happened and with the realisation that Germans are just people like them. So do we see in Kit's diary, Janet, that we've got, does she, how does she go with the being under British command instead of being at, under the Australian command? Is she more restricted because the British were very different to how the Australian hospitals were run? We do. We see they were highly restricted and it made it worse because they come from all the socialising in Cairo. And one of the things they had experienced on Lemnos, the upside of it, was that they had a lot of freedom. They were right away from, you know, the eyes of their village at home. They were riding horses, you know, astride instead of side saddle. There was a lot of socialising. When they went to the Western Front under the British um, matron in chief who was in charge all of that stopped so there was no fraternizing with officers there was no speaking to private soldiers there was no dancing um, and they were sending people home that that transgressed these rules 
and of course Chris um, kept being not only Australian part of part of performing being an Australian was you know the kind of freedom and initiative that we have um, she um, really didn't react very well to this and she, how it began was that the matron came to her she was talking to an Australian sergeant and she said we can't have those Australian men hanging around here and Kit was furious and she said in her diary that she let the matron know let the matron see that she was angry which is a huge difference from their training they would never have done that in an Australian hospital but she felt the difference one of the reasons is that the People in charge in the British hospitals tended to be regular army. So what they did was they had a regular army nursing service in England and they took those army trained nurses and they spread them across the hospitals in charge because they thought, well, they'll know how to do it. So they knew how to fill in the forms and all that sort of thing. But to the Australians, it looked like all they cared about was whether the beds were neat. Or they didn't care about the patients and also they didn't do the nursing was the Australians were used to being hands-on, but the, the senior British nurses were supervisors. They'd supervise the orderlies, they'd supervise the VADs, but the Australians were used to working. So she tended to gravitate towards the Scottish nurses who were more like her. And she, she read those differences as, as um, national, that there were national differences between the British and the, and the Australians. But they did tend to see them as colonial because they saw the Canadians treated the same way. And the, um, they also knew that they weren't getting the best sites, the, the heaviest casualties, because the British simply didn't value them. I think it was a shock to them because our nurses were very highly trained. So, yes, there was, there was some um, friction there. Um, one of our matrons said she wondered whether we didn't go the other way, that, you know, maybe we should have paid a bit more attention to the forms and the, and the breakages. <laughs> but, um, yes, there were, there were differences. There were differences in, and that was a shock to them because at the time they just felt that they were Britons overseas. I don't think they expected there to be a difference. So was there, I know you've just said this, but did did the British nurses did they respect the australians of what they could do or were they was there a lack of trust or divisions you know um but there were divisions between us too like the nurses used to say oh, new, new south wales nurses they're no good um it's better when victoria wants to take over um so there were those kind of divisions as well <coughs> pardon me our nurses also wore red capes and only the british matrons did and so that caused a bit of, you know, commentary. One matron said, oh, here come all the matrons. Um, so there was competition, you know, there was differences. So what do we see, Janet, in, in the way that, uh, how did Kit and the other nurses write about their friendships in their diaries with fellow soldiers that they met while they were nursing them back to health? They had to be very careful um, because... One of the arguments against them even going to war was a moral one that, you know, it would cause uh, problems with discipline. And so they had to find a way of writing about these um, relationships that wouldn't cause the military to get upset or their families at home because they're writing these diaries for their families. So what they did was that they cast it all in family relationships. So the nurses were their boys or they were dear old chaps like, you know, their favourite uncle. Um, safe relationships that had have boundaries. Now, we know that there were romances because Kit had one herself, um, but they were very, very um, carefully written. You have to read between the lines and they were sold to their readers so kit would say to her mother who was a very staunch catholic these men are the irishmen they're catholics they know people we know it's okay for us to go out with them they had to be very careful um but the men sought them out they were because i 
I was looking at nurses, I had the impression that the nurses were everywhere. They were in big hospitals full of nurses. But I met a soldier, Jack Lockett, who went very young to war, and he was still alive when I began this um, work. Beautiful man. And he told me that he never saw an Australian nurse on the Western Front. So they were numerically, you know, very small in number and very highly valued. So for the soldiers, they were not just their sisters, nursing sisters, they were sisters from home and sisters in arms. And the soldiers sought them out because they'd been going through terrible things on Gallipoli and again on the Western Front, but they couldn't tell anybody. They couldn't tell their family back home um, because they were protecting them. They couldn't complain to fellow soldiers because you know, there was an idea of, you know, warlike masculinity. Um, and so it was only the nurses that could actually really confide in to get emotional support from. And so they sought them out because the, the, the nurses' friendships were like that between each other. They talked was men's friendships with each other were more side by side and based on occupation that they were doing at the time. So they, the nurses gave the soldiers a great deal in terms of emotional support. And Kit often says that they confided in them all the terrible things that had happened. But constrained by the same restrictions, Kit never told us what they were. We never get to know either. She never said, but she heard from them and she supported them. And in return, the nurses got a really thrilling time. They got taken out. The, the officers took them out in Lemnos and in Cairo to, you know, to hotels and to concerts and not on the western front she had to fib and say that one of these soldiers was a cousin they weren't allowed to ride around in cars with officers um but they did their best so how important was harold burke's friendship with kit what and can you explain to us a little bit about harold's relationship with kit well kit met harold on lemnos he was her patient he was in the 5th Battalion and they'd come off, they'd been at Quinn's Post, they'd been at Lone Pine um, in just terrible conditions. And she gradually, um, they became close in terms of a sisterly relationship, but they kept as friends throughout the war. And the friendships that she made on Lemnos those friendships were supportive to her all the way through the war, but they were all the same kind of men. They were all Australians or New Zealanders. They were all from the same kind of social class as her. They were from families where everyone in the family went to war. So Paddy Burke had three of his siblings at war as well. And they were people who'd end the war quite decorated. So you can kind of tell from Kitty's friends what Kitty valued and what she valued in herself. So he took her and her friend Ida, never by herself, always with her friend. They would go out um, to concerts, to dinners. Um, They spent their leaves together from the Western Front. They went to see all the shows in the West End. He would visit them when they were serving in various units. So they provided, you know, a, a continuity, a support, and really what they turned into was a a war family. They did things for each other that a family would do, um, providing them with shopping, support, letters. They would write to each other. We forget that there is a correspondence going on along the front. It's not just coming home and going back. It's between the people that are fighting and the people that are stationed there. So they were enormously important. They sustained them through the war. During the war, there were two conscription referendums in Australia. What do what does Kit's diaries reveal about her feelings towards conscription and how did she differ from other nurses with the regards to conscription? Well, that's a really interesting question because Kit says nothing. And that's unusual. In in the context of the diaries, the men and the nurses all say that there's a conscription referendum. The men say what they think. Um, Then the nurses get to vote because the Australians and New Zealanders are the only women on the Western Front who are permitted to vote. 
they, they're enfranchised and it's a big deal. And so they all, all vote in the referendum and they're all saying things like um, Kit's friend Olive Haynes is saying, you know, um, it's terrible that, we, that it wasn't put through. Um, here we are watching the, you know, the, there's people at home that won't go and we're seeing the good people being sent to the front and dying. But Kit's absolutely silent. And the reason she's silent is that in her person, she embodies the three sets of people that the government is going to say defeated the referendum. Women, the rural people and Catholics. And it's, a, it's an unfair um, aspersion to cast, but she she knows that her hometown, because of the letters that are coming back and forwards, she knows that Little River is going to vote against that referendum. Her family is, and she knows that the community is, and they do. Um, it's out, out of um, sync with the rest of Victoria, but Little River does vote against it quite significantly. And there are reasons for that. There are, um, it's a rural um, environment and she's a farmer, all her family's a farmer and just before the first referendum, the government's so sure it's going to go through that they call all the Ellerville men into camp and it's just before harvest and just before shearing. So they get a really good look at what it's going to be like if these men get constricted. And at this stage, I've had a look at the people who went from Little River and everybody who is ever going to go has already gone. The only ones that are still to go are those waiting to come of age. Um, everybody else has already gone. So every person that can be spared has left and the people who are left behind are there for a reason. Um, they, they're the only child of you know, parents. We see them going before the exemption committee saying, I can't go, you know, I'm the only person left here. Um, so there's, there are a variety of reasons why people aren't going to go. The Catholics, of course, have got a different view of the situation than, than the rest of us because um, of the Protestants, because they've come from other countries and, you know, have got a different view of what stake we should have in all of this. Um, so Kit knows and she doesn't, so she's very conflicted about this because she is seeing the soldiers going to the front and dying as well. And she has close friends amongst them and she supports what they're doing. So she's very, very conflicted about it. And so she says nothing. And her silence is enormous. It's loud. Which, for as you've said as well, for Kit, that was very unusual, wasn't it? Because she she was in, she was very much writing a lot yes. during the war, and there's only certain periods of the war where she's quiet. And and because she came, and correct me if I'm wrong, did she come from a family of twelve? Is that correct? Like she had a family? Was it? No, she's no. She came. She had a a big wider family, um, but she. Um, I think there were. Looking back, I'd have to check, but there are probably sort of seven or eight. Some were lost in infancy. Um, she has brothers. She has, at the moment when she goes to war, she, there is Kit and her three brothers, Duncan, Sam and Dougald. They're a Scottish family. Why Kit was overseas? Did her mum pass away while she, she was... Yeah, she did die. How did that affect Kit? Oh, hugely. She stopped writing a diary for a while because I don't think she could bring herself to, because by this stage, uh, when they first went, soldiers and nurses imagined like a triumphal homecoming, but home after what they went through turned into the idea of a sanctuary, you know, the, the idea that it was there, that even in the midst of this darkness and these terrible things, that they would be able to go home. And Kit's father was already dead. And so when Kit's mother died, that was one of her sources of news, a big audience for her diary. And also she would have no home because the home would, would just disappear. They were actually leasing the property where they were. And so that would just, there would be no place for her to go home to. And that's one of the things she says, no home anymore. I'm lost now. And it's, I suppose, Janet, we all look at that and go, we, 
home is such it's so important to all of us to have that place to even when you go overseas you travel you come back to have that your home it's your kingdom it's your inner sanctum of your place that you treasure close to your heart and i can feel that i understand why kit would be you know because it had been well she said goodbye to her mum in 1915 and then that was it that was that that was the last time she'd ever spoken to her and and it's we know through letters and you know through what we do now with zoom and and telephones but it would be tough. It would be very tough. Yeah. Yes. Yes, she was. She stopped writing for quite a long time and only started again when she went on leave. And that was the impetus of the idea of, of the diary as a travel diary because they were going to London, the centre of the empire, and here were things that she should write about for the people home that she should remember too. So there's this six-page, you know, description of a visit to Windsor, you know, so she starts writing again and she's seeing her friends again in London. She sees Harold again. They stay in the same hotels or a lot of people that came out on the ship with her. So she does start writing again. Kit was the first Australian plastic surgeon nurse. Can you tell us about what was involved in what she had to go through to become the first plastic surgeon nurse? Well, Kit was a, a theatre nurse, so she worked. She was in charge of the theatres at a clearing station um, during Passchendaele. And I think we've lost, you know, we, we kind of don't realise how specialised being a theatre nurse was because when she finally went on leave again after that stint in, the, in early 1918, she was sent to Dartford. They were kept in England if they were looking worn out and she, she well and truly was by then because she'd been through the Somme, she'd been through Passchendaele and she'd been ill. And so they kept her and her friends in England and sent her to a hospital, Dartford, where a nurse was put on, on uh, theatre duty and refused to go. She said she hadn't been trained, it would be bad for her nerves. So somebody like Kit that had run the you know, a string of operating theatres at a clearing station during Passchendaele was a gift. And so at the end of a stint at, at Dartford, what they had done was that the, the people who developed plastic surgery during the First World War, and there was a terrible need for it because the helmets covered the head, but if you put your face over the edge of a trench, then your face was unprotected and there were terrible facial wounds, terrible wounds to their face, their jaw. So a hospital at Sidkirk in Kent was set up and um, the two men who developed plastic surgery had an English unit there. And it was so successful that they decided that they would open up separate units within the hospital for Australians and Canadians. And the Americans came over and had a look at what they were doing. Gillies and Fry were the people who developed it. And so an Australian unit was set up with um, Sir Henry Newland in charge and Kit was transferred there as the um, to work in the operating theatres as a plastic surgery nurse. She was the first one. I think they ended up with sort of six or seven. Her friend was brought over as well. And but she she didn't write about it. And all we know, we know the details that we can glean from. We have photographs. We have details we can glean from the official records, and we have. Gertrude Mobley's account, she was a nurse who went across on the ship with Kit. She went to visit the hospital and said that when she left, all she could do was collapse into the gutter and cry and cry at what she'd seen. And just hearing that, the, the hairs stand up, you know, just and poor Kit and all the nurses, Janet, of what they saw, like they... They'd suffer their own PTSD from what they'd seen from their service. And I think it's something that we we don't, like, we don't pay enough attention to, it, in my opinion, of the advances that came of the First World War in medicine. Like, just the care with, with nursing and the, and the, like, plastic surgery and all these things that came out of the First World War. Medicine in my in my belief advanced so far during those four years than what it did in the previous 50 years and and it's it's just amazing that we we don't we don't seem to pay attention to that uh, part of the war that we seem to 
we seem to gloss over that and and it's it's a remarkable you know it's remarkable to see what actually happened over those four years in in the medical care yes and in the care of sickness and malaria and it's because of the focus on the frontline soldiers so we focus on the fighting the wounding um, but what happens behind, I mean, I guess people are aware that it's there, but the focus, unless in specialised areas of academia, you know, they focus on it. But, you know, we don't have the general awareness that here's a second battlefield that people are fighting on. That's right. Exactly right. And Kit and the other nurses face exactly the same the same trauma that the men at the front facing just as well. In terms of seeing the wounds, they did. And when she was faced with the Battle of the Somme, we do get to see what she saw because in this part of the diary, she's writing about German soldiers. So she doesn't have to protect the people at the front. It's more like, look, you know, they're terribly wounded. It's a sign that we're winning the war. She can't say that about our own men. In fact, it's banned from letters and from um, and from newspapers. Anything that's prejudicial to recruiting, gruesome descriptions of wounds are completely forbidden. And yet she can talk about the wounds when she's at, during the song, because she's nursing German soldiers. But of course, they're no differently wounded than our own men are. So we get through her eyes and her pen what's happening. And she has a ward with 40 men in it. And she, she says, I've got 11 with their legs off and with their arms off. And she talks about a wound so bad that she can actually see the man's heart beating. Um, and they have gas gangrene. And the, this is a shock to the nurses because the nurses are trained in Australia in what was called a septic surgery, germ-free surgery, where, you know, everything's sterile. They're sterilising the instruments. They've got you know, disinfectants. And, of course, now they're on the Western Front. They're, they're fighting in farmland. It's been manured for centuries. And so when they're hit with pieces of shell or a bullet, it pushes pieces of the material from their uniform, which has probably been on their backs for, you know, weeks in these terrible conditions, into their body. And there's, they're just a cocktail of toxins coming with them. And the nurses are seeing wounds. You just, well, you don't see the kind of wounds in civilian life. One of the nurses, her friend, Olive Haynes, said, if we got two accident victims at the Adelaide Hospital in one night, we thought we were killed. Now they're getting hundreds of people flooding in with terrible injuries, but they're also getting what's called gas gangrene, which is caused by the gases released by these toxins. And... If they don't amputate the leg once they realise that the gas gangrene is happening, it causes the, the limbs to swell. If they don't amputate it, the person dies. Like the leg goes in a day, gets gangrene. And there are complaints from England. Why, why there's so many amputations? But that's why. The, the whole nothing prepared them for what would go on there. And even less were they prepared when she went up to the clearing station because there you see the injuries that don't make it to the bases and you could see and the other thing that is happening to them is by this stage they know a lot of soldiers they're related to a lot of soldiers and they've met lots of soldiers and they could turn to get the next person onto the operating table and find that they know them and that's another thing that they have to to deal with there are people they can't save um, they're sending them backwards and forwards. At the clearing station, Alice Ross King says that all day they hear the last post playing in the cemetery next to them, the people that they, they can't save. And um, they're working flat out to, to save the ones they can. Kit um, said, oh, she didn't, she didn't actually say anything. At the clearing station, in the door that was open during so the song when we saw the German soldiers is shut because she's treating allied soldiers she doesn't even mention the word wound you wouldn't know she was a nurse if you hadn't read the rest of the diary but the matron in charge later on wrote a report for the authorities um, to help things for the next war and she said that they would be lifted onto the operating table still in their khaki with a tourniquet around a limb that had been blown off most people had at least 10 wounds 
And those that had fractured femurs were so shocked by the journey down from the front that just lifting them onto the operating table would put them into so much shock they couldn't operate and make the pulse go off and they'd have to be taken off to be resuscitated. So that's the kind of thing that they're dealing with. And we know that they're operating. Just minor ones, it's not mentioned in the diary. Kit mentions it when she's with the Germans. And as she said, she said, I, with, I took a bullet out of a German's back. And the really um, interesting thing about that is not that she was glad to do it, but that she was allowed to do it because nurses aren't trained to do it. They're not supposed to do it. <coughs> Pardon me. The big boundary between them and doctors is surgery. But at war, they had to. So as the war dragged on, Janet, and we see that, Kit, was Kit becoming tired of the war and how did she cope with the loss of friends who she nursed and what toll did it take on her health and her appearance? She started after the song. One of the things she said was life's a blank because her friends are starting to be killed. They're um, being taken prisoner. She's, she's dealt with huge rushes of patients and hasn't made a dent, however hard she works in their numbers. And you start to see things happen to her, like Ted Connor from Little River, who she goes to church with at home, comes to visit her. And a month later, he's dead. And five days after that, his brother's dead. And her sister-in-law has to go and tell their mother, who Kit would have known, one day after the other, two consecutive days that she lost two of her sons. So that's what's happening. She starts to become quite disengaged in the diary too. You start to see that she, she has PTSD because she has lost the kind of even sightseeing impetus. When she's moved to England, two of the nurses that are with her have not been in France as long as she has. And they're keen to go back. But Kit's, Kit's fulfilled what she feels she should have done. Like soldiers need to see battle to feel that they have, you know, fulfilled their, um, their kind of reason for being there. She feels that she's done hers. The others are busy sightseeing, but she's not. And she's not even saying things like the hospital's bombed and she doesn't even mention it. Whereas the others are writing reams about it. But... She's trying to find other things. You can tell that she's quite um, affected by the war. And when we mentioned that she was affected by the war, when did she stop writing in her diary and why? What was the reason why she finally stopped and didn't continue writing? Well, she stopped in an odd place. The diary that she was writing in had pages still left in it. The war, you know... You could see the end of the war, um, so that would have been a natural place perhaps to stop. Um, she was being moved to a new unit. She was going to Sidcup to be the plastic surgery nurse, and she would usually say, describe the place, describe the wards, describe what she was doing, and then work wouldn't be part of the rest of it. But that was a, an opportunity to say, here I am, this is what it's like. But she just stopped. And one thing that did happen is that Harold Burke was killed He'd gone all the way through the war. Um, he was beloved of his battalion um, and he was killed just as the war is coming to, the, to an end in August. And we don't know how she was told. We don't know how Ida was told. Um, we know that when his mother was told, she reacted so badly that the father wrote to the government and said, please don't send any news about my other children home. Send them to the office. But... I think that she, that was the last straw. I think that she couldn't write the diary without saying that Harold was gone and she couldn't say that Harold was gone. She, she just didn't have the words for it. I think it just took the heart out of her. So she didn't. She didn't write anymore. And it, it happened to some degree to most of them because even the soldiers, there are so many Australian diaries of the journey to war, but there are hardly any of the journey home. You know, they've lost their heart. I can see because she developed over many years a friendship with with Harold and, and you can see that 
And I know hindsight's a wonderful thing and they could have probably seen that the war was coming to an end and, and it was so close and he died so close to the end of the war that most of them were just trying to survive that last little period just to just to come home and to be... I can understand why Kit was broken. Like, loss of any family or friend is, is huge on anyone and, and especially, you know, the friendship that they developed... I can understand why it would be just that's it. I'm I'm not going to write in my diary anymore. And... No, she's working too at Sitka with the with the terrible injuries to the faces. Um, the war family. One of the things women do in their diary that they're allowed to do and expected to do is record social information and family information. So she writes when her family from home write to her and writes what news. And she writes information about a war family, all that, you know, Harold and Dave from Lemnos, all those people that she'd met, when they write to her what they're doing, that she'd heard from them, but they're going. Like the three Lodge brothers from Little River are all dead, um, one after the other. One goes, he's killed, another goes to avenge him, and the last one goes and they're all gone. Um, and so there's less and less people. The Connett brothers are gone. They're, they're all dead. Or, um, and she's looking at the terrible injuries of, of the people who are at the end of the war that they're going to have to carry for the rest of their lives. So I think that the heart, she was also burnt out. I think she'd started to be burnt out after the song and, the, and Passchendaele just put paid to it because she started to write at Passchendaele very surreal paragraphs that showed how how far away home was now and how how surreal her life had become there were paragraphs like harold burke had met somebody in a shell hole and they'd asked about me so and so has been killed we went to and the next sentence is we went to a concert at an artillery place and it was bon you know that it's just very very odd combination of things to say as though she's lost her bearings in a way of, of what home is like. There's a disjunction with home as well. It's taken letters a long time to get to them. So they're in this very odd place. They're in an apocalyptic environment on the edge of the wall with all these unbelievable things happening, cut off from home, with people around them dying, viewing the most terrible results of the war right in front of them time after time after time, um, seeing their friends dying, and it's having, you know, understandably an enormous effect. So the war ends, and we know, obviously, the troops and the nurses have to come home. Do we know Kit's journey home was like and what her reception of when she came home was like in Australia? Well, that's, that's an interesting question too because we do know what the journey home was like but not from Kit. She'd stop writing the diary so we can only catch glimpses of her as she writes to um, government and says, you know, I want to go home. Um, but there are a lot of records of, the, of a ship's journey home because it's a huge organisational um, effort to, to get all the troops from the Western Front to go home. She goes home on quota 45, the 45th ship to go home. And we have their, their records. We know where, when she got there, she took the train up from to Liverpool Station. She was the charge nurse. And that gives an insight into Kit's character too because there'd been complaints about the behaviour of nurses on the ship's home. And the word had come back to be very careful how you choose the charge nurses and Kit was chosen. So she was in charge of the... There are another six nurses. She had to organise their work and um, where they sat at dinner and, and supervise them so they didn't do anything untoward. And, but we also have a, a troop ship journal, the Echo, the Ocean Echo, that talks about what went on on the ship. And it talks about the sports that they have. There's a whole issue dedicated to the women and there's only six of them there's thousands of the troops so you can see how valued they are we discern from this that the nurses are completely gray kit's gone gray um one of the nurses that are 
was her friend on Lemnos, is white. And these nurses are only in their 30s. Harold Burt, before he died, wrote to her saying, I'm going grey. Wrote to his mother saying, I'm going grey. So they're all grey. Kit's lost two stone um, because of everything that's gone on. She's been ill. She's had diphtheria. She's had paratyphoid. She's had pleurisy, um, which is not surprising given the conditions that they're in. On this troop ship, too, in the journal, you get a glimpse into the darker side of the journey home, that there are shadows there, that the ghosts of the people that are not coming back are with them. And they have to, soldiers and the nurses have to register to get their deferred pay. They have to give their bank accounts. And in the Ocean Echo, it says, be careful how you spend this money. It's the biggest amount of money you'll probably ever see. And never was money so hard earned. And the quartermaster writes a poem that's in it's the most confronting poem from the First World War that I've read. And it ends with a paragraph um, where he says his son said to him, I want to be a soldier. And the quartermaster writes, before that day um, arrives, I hope God destroys us all. Um, so it's... They're coming back. They know that they're not the same people that left. A lot of people aren't coming back and neither are the people that they once were. They have diggers parliaments on board and that's one of the most popular forms of entertainment because they, I think they feel that they have, um, in a way, the right to have some say in what goes on in post-war Australia because of what they have done. So it's a, it's a very different kind of journey. And you see them when they see the Southern Cross, when they smell eucalyptus, when they think they're going to be home. It's very moving. And the last it's... issue of the Ocean Echo says, you know, don't forget to buy the Ocean Echo when next you go to war. And it's a key point you touch on too, is that for Kit and some of the lucky men that left, you know, in 1914 and came back in 1919, they're leaving a different Australia. They're coming home to a di like they left Australia in a, in a different place, and they're coming home to a different Australia than what they what they would experience. And they often, as you say, yeah. into the 19 into the 1920s, it was a very different. We were divided, but in a way, when we went to war, and tell me if I'm wrong, Janet, that we... It was divided. Were we naive in how we went to war? Did we, did we approach it in a naive approach of going to the First World War? I wonder. I suppose there's been a lot of discussion in, in terms of us going to support the empire, but that was the mindset of the time. You know, that, that, were, the, that were the values that we had. So we weren't, it, there wasn't naivety in that sense. Everybody going to that war would have been naive in terms of what it was like to be in a mechanised war. It was the first mechanised war. No, look, I think we're probably naive only in the sense, this is just thinking of it on the hop, that anybody going would really have no idea what it's like to be in a war. And I wonder whether we do now. You know, I guess our soldiers going overseas are regular army. So, you know, they, but these were civilians. So they would have been, they were, yes, they were volunteers. Now, they were trained in ways that I think are forgotten because they, we had compulsory um, service prior to the First World War where children from the age of, I've forgotten what it is, early teens, had to train cadets and um, there were reservists. It was a it was a something that everybody had to do. They were trained to to shoot guns and so on. So they had that background as well. And um, Kit's family, when those that went were country people, but no one would have any idea what it would be like to be in those trenches. They wouldn't have known what it'd be like to be on Gallipoli. You know, they were they were farmers and bank clerks. And... Yeah, very different to the modern army that we have today. So what 
What awards did Kit get for her service? She um, was mentioned in dispatches for her work with the Germans and she, during the Somme, and she won the Royal Red Cross First Class, which is a, a huge thing. It's nurse, war nursing's highest honour. And she got it in the peace dispatch. It was released on her way home and she received it from the Prince of Wales at Government House. But she always said to her family that she got it for the time at the clearing station in charge of the um, operating theatres and they, there was rumours of an attack and the nurses were told to fall back and she wouldn't go. She stayed. Um, so, And she said that everybody had the wind up. Um, but that's what she said she got it for. But it was a very high honour. Absolutely. And for you, Janet, what part of Kit's story is most satisfying for you? That's a, that's a very hard one. I think when I was trying to get Kitty's War published as a book, one of the publishers told me that the hardest story to get published is a book about an unknown woman by an unknown woman and I suppose that in a way is very satisfying that that this unknown woman's story is now told and it stands for a, a lot of the the women when I go back and I look at that war memorial in Lara where I found her name behind every single name on that memorial is a similar story like Kit's story is not unique. I mean, she was unique in, in her personality and, you know, the nuances of it. But every person on that monument had their own story, their own background, their own family they left behind, their own war story and their own battles and challenges when they got home. So I think that probably was the most powerful thing for me that, um, that everybody on those monuments across Australia has got the same story, you know, that, that I told about Kit. So for you, Janet, how would you like the Anzac nurses' legacy to be remembered going forward in, in Australia's, you know, as we move forward? I think it's happening. I think the time when they were forgotten is being left in the past. I think there's enough work being done. And I think the soldiers themselves... Um, they they value and honour the nurses' service. It was never forgotten by them. I remember when we opened a monument in Little River to Kit and Sadie and all the other nurses, I was sitting next to a soldier who was in Vietnam and he couldn't take his eyes off Jan McCarthy, who was the um, head of the Army Nursing Service, and he said to me, she was in Vietnam, she was a nurse, and the honour that he had for her was just remarkable, a revelation to me. Kit and Ida were cheered to the echo everywhere they went with their soldiers, cheered from the troop ships, cheered in the camps. So they were never not remembered by the soldiers, but there was a, a long period of decades where they were kind of forgotten in the shadows by the general public. And I, but I think that's fading into the past. I think their, the, their um, contribution and their service, I think there's enough work being done now. There are gaps, but it is being remembered. And the others too, the nurses weren't the only ones. Not everybody who went to the, not everybody in Australia um, went to the First World War. Everybody in Australia experienced the First World War and it affected them. Not every Australian went to the First World War. Not every Australian who went to the First World War went to the front. And um, not every Australian who went to the First World War was male. But now we're recognising that. We're recognising that the home front too is an area where people, you know, experience the war. They had their own experience of it. So I think we become, we're moving away from... The frontline soldier is the, and the wounded frontline soldier is the only one whose story should be told. Everybody who experienced the First World War was affected by it, and they've all got a story. Absolutely, and and that's why I wanted to get you on because to to share Kitty's story. It's a, I read the book and just just fell in love with the book, and I got in contact with you, and that and I. I 
believe that it's important that we tell these f- forgotten parts of, of our history and, and we bring a, and we shine a light on them. And, and for me, that's why I love ha- doing the podcast because I can, I can bring these subjects forward to people and they, they can learn. And, and yeah. so where can people get a copy of Kitty's War? And just to wrap it up, and it's been a fantastic to have you on and an honour to have you on, what are you working on now? Well, Kitty's War is available in bookstores and online from UQP, University of Queensland Press. And at the moment, I'm working on um, a group of men who fought in the desert in the First World War who've been largely forgotten. Not much work's been done on them. Um, They were the Australians who fought after Gallipoli who joined the Imperial Camel Corps. So they fought in um, the Sinai and the Palestine campaigns. And itself has been a neglected theatre of war until relatively recently and so that's what I'm working on at the moment through their same thing through their own records their own work that's and and is there potentially there's going to be a book in that as well there will be there will be more than one book when it's out please I'll stay in contact with you and let me know and and I will get it and would love to have you back on to talk about that because these are all fascinating chapters of Australia's military history that I believe we we need to shine light on and and the the generations going forward need to know of what you know of what's happened in our past because I believe Jen and I've said this to you before without knowing our without knowing our past we've got no future no, that is exactly right. And so many voices have been silenced um, over the last decades, and it's good that their voices are now being heard. Correct, correct. No, so Dr. Janet Butler, thank you so much for coming on and, and, and sharing Kit's story and also the broader story of the Anzac nurses that went away during the, the Great War. So Dr. Janet Butler, thank you so much for coming on True Blue History. It's a pleasure. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for the podcast on whatever platform you get your podcasts. And if you feel like supporting us, you can now via our Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash true blue history or buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash true blue history and check out our new website, true blue history dot com for more great content.